Thank you, everybody. I, I, that picture of Galapagos was so funny because I remember it's going into a Brooklyn nightclub at like nine in the morning. It was like, I, <laughs> like I, that was the moment I sort of, won I wondered whether this was going to survive, actually. So it just seemed like a weird, weird idea. But hey, it worked. And, and nothing gives me more satisfaction than getting even 1% of credit for all the hard work that Tina and her crew actually have done to make this happen. So I don't deserve even a tenth of 1%, but thank you, Tina, for inviting me back to celebrate uh, 15. It's amazing. Um, uh, and uh, she, I remember back in uh, 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 2010 when, we, when I did that talk, um, she said, why don't you talk about clients? And it's just so happened that I've been thinking about it a lot myself. And um, so it was a great coincidence. I was interested in it and I sort of like thought, okay, this is a chance to think about that. So this time she said, the theme is endurance. And um, it's, that's been something I've been thinking about a lot lately as well. Um, and I had done a talk, I don't know, like about eight, nine, 10 years ago. And I was in my, um, it was about being old, basically. I, I'm not sure how explicit I was about it, but I realized I was like, the oldest speaker at a conference, and I sort of thought, um, okay, I'm, I'm okay, right? Everything's okay? Okay. Uh, I, I was feeling self-conscious, and I thought, like, old guy comes out, what, you know, what, who cares? And so I sort of, like, was musing about that and feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, you know, I must have been, like, what, 54? So... I'm, I'm now in my late 60s, and so like I, I was sort of prematurely worrying about getting old. Now, I don't have to do that anymore, because I am, but, but. so, um, and so I, I had done a talk back then that was supposed to be about wisdom in a way, and um, I looked back and it sort of like didn't have, it had some wisdom, but not that much, so I sort of said, I'm gonna try to get this right for you guys this morning, so I'm an old guy, here, are, here is some wisdom, perhaps, okay, so. Hello, this is what I've learned um, over my uh, life so far. Um, Michael Barut, I'm 66 years old. I got a thing during the pandemic. It was a real moment. Uh, I got this envelope from the Social Security Administration that said, um, you may be thinking about retiring. Here's the steps that you would go through to qualify for your Social Security benefits. And I have to admit, I was sort of like dumbstruck by this. Uh, it was, you know, and, and not only that, but they, you get a very customized thing. They sort of list every year you earn money going back to when I was doing internships in college. And it's, and they tell you exactly how much you would get if you retired every month. Um, it's, it's not bad actually. Um, you know, sort of, I, I was sort of like thinking, well, I guess they want me to begin thinking about this now. Uh, the government does. So I'm sort of like trying to be a good citizen. So. I started thinking about my life so far, and a lot of that thinking has gone into what I'll talk about this morning. Um, so I was born in 1957, the same year that um, Helvetica was designed, actually, but who's... Um, <laughs> so we're both old, I guess. Um, um, and I, it is, these are some of the things I learned sort of along the way. I was a quiet, introverted, nerdy kid I, I was a little bit bookish, if, I can, if a first grader can be bookish. But um, I sort of was, I like, wasn't good at sports. I didn't have what you call riz uh, as a first grader, I believe. Uh, and, um, uh, um, but then one day, um, I think the teacher to kill time was raining outside and uh, Mrs. Canola said, um, why doesn't everyone in, um, in the class just draw something that they see in the room? And I drew what, I drew like a really detailed drawing. I remember still, it was, I don't have it still, but it was like a, uh, uh, you know, the flag in the corner, the window showing the playground outside. I sort of really drew it fairly faithfully, you know, as a six or seven year old could. And um, Mrs. Canola was impressed and sent it home to my parents with a note saying, it looks like Michael has the makings of a real artist. And my parents, I think, reacted to this with like a bit of alarm because they, uh, I grew up in a, a suburban Cleveland uh, where the main cultural center of my town was the bowling alley probably. Uh, and, um, um, and like they didn't know any artists or even like this sounded, this actually sounded like, um, uh, uh, what's the word for it? A, um, like I'd been diagnosed with something that would need special <laughs> attention. And so, um, they, um, luckily they, a, a friend of theirs had a, like a, a, like one of my cousins several times removed actually was going to art school, was going to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. 
So they said, um, could we ask, could, could you ask um, her like what we should do with Michael, with, you know, what should be done with Michael? Uh, and um, with Mike, as they call me. And, um, and she said, well, you know, the Cleveland Museum of Art has Saturday morning art classes. And so my mom, God bless her, got in her Ford Falcon with me every Saturday morning and drove from the southwest suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, to the beautiful, extraordinary Cleveland Museum of Art shown here, which um, I don't think she had ever been in before in her life. Um, uh, and, but she sort of like walked me in there and I started taking these Saturday morning art classes for kids. And, um, you know, just, just like um, uh, uh, Tina was saying, you know, you, all of a sudden you find your people. Um, you know, I, I went from this place that like I was never, I've never been good at bowling, for instance, and that was, seemed to be something that uh, the, the adults around me seemed interested in. But on the other hand, I went in here and it just was surrounded by all these things that had this, you know, power and, and, and inspirational, just, just beauty in a way. And um, um, so I started taking these classes and one of the exercises was um, they would show you a painting and you'd have like whatever drawing tools you have and they say, you know, try to draw what you see in this painting. And so uh, one of them is the um, uh, uh, painting called The Burning of Houses of Lords and Commons by uh, uh, J.M.W. Turner, 1834. It's really one of the most beautiful things in their collection. I don't have that drawing from uh, first grade, but I do have the drawing I did of that at the, at the age of seven. And um, on the back of it, it says The Burning of Houses of Lords and Commons by Michael Beirut, age seven. Uh, <laughs> So, I, so for the first time, and not the last time, I put my name on work that actually was inspired very much by someone else, and uh, uh, maybe setting in, in, in motion a lifelong um, bad habit of mine. But so, um, uh, then I learned, like, the only how to draw I had a certain kind of status. People would say, oh, yeah, yeah you, you drew that? Like, it's sort of, you know, if people who otherwise would be inclined to either ignore me or maybe even beat me up on the playground sort of saw that I had some magic utility somehow. I was able to, uh, uh, to draw things. And so some, you know, I, I wasn't good at sports, I wasn't good at a lot of things, but knowing how to draw actually gave me a minimum amount of status in a world where I felt like I otherwise had none. Um, but I sort of like also thought, well, you know, the, um, you know, this long drive to the art museum was this weird sort of daunting repository of this realm of art. And the idea, like I didn't feel like that was my destiny to be in that museum. I can sort of like tell that. So um, I had this second revelation a few years later, and it's like a very keen, clear childhood memory of um, being driven to get my hair cut by my dad on Granger Road in Garfield Heights, Ohio. And we stopped at an intersection and my dad pointed at a construction site and said, that's really clever. And this is a, um, simulation of that experience this is not he didn't take a picture of it i found this online um but he said um and i said w what and he said well look how neat it is so you see on the side of the truck the way they wrote clark and i'm like yeah then he said it's a forklift truck and they did the l so it's kind of lifting up the a and i was like oh my god <laughs> it's like is like and then i'm like it, you know who else knows about this you know <laughs> And like, I was so electrified by this. And of course, you know, I think, um, um, kudos for my dad, right? Um, like this is now, this is like the, did you know there's an arrow in the FedEx logo kind of moment. But this was like a pretty subtle thing. And I remember thinking, um, I can't paint like Turner, but whatever this is, you know, I, I'd love to figure out how to do this. And like, and, and like, you know, you didn't have to go to our museum for it. It's just like they're in a construction site, you know, a little bit of beauty, a little bit of joy, a little bit of magic, and it's right there. How do you do that? Who does that? I had no idea. Um, but I sort of like realized then that art had a kind of utility, like it stopped you from getting beat up on the playground perhaps, also could raise your grade in a way. So um, this is a report I did in the sixth grade on the... Um, uh, Titanic, well in advance of uh, James Cameron, I was kind of testing the <laughs> Titanic wave, if you will. Um, June 2nd, 1969, an outstanding report, A plus underlined twice, says Miss McDonald. Um, and I think it was not only the excellence of the research I had done on the subject, but these detailed, fantastical drawings I did with a big pen uh, at my kitchen table in my house, sort of, and you can sort of see how much I love drawing clouds and how uneasy I felt about drawing drowning people. Uh, 
So you sort of have, and I, that iceberg is done with a lot of tender, loving care too, rooting for the bad guy in the picture, I suppose. Um, and so I think what I was learning was that there was this other thing that wasn't art specifically, and the thing that wasn't art was something that could you, that could be classified as design. And because I had this reputation, a moment came when I was about 15 years old where uh, the kids from the drama club said to me, um, hey Mike, could you draw the poster for the play? And I went to a, um, a vocational high school, meaning half of the kids went to college, the other half, and probably more than half, ended up just skipping college going right into some sort of a, um, a trade. And we had a big print shop in the basement. And so whatever I designed was going to be given to the kids who were doing uh, vocational training in the printing, uh, the arts of printing and reproduction. And uh, um, uh, so I did a piece of artwork and then turned it over to the drama club. They in turn gave it to the printing guys and they went in the basement. And then I came in the next Monday and the play was called Wait Until Dark. And I sort of like faithfully read the play. What's this all about? And it's about, it's, it's about a, a, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie or has actually seen the play. It's about a blind woman being threatened by some bad guys. And it's, it's got a great like holy cow moment in the third act that I won't spoil for you, but it's, it's, if you see this movie, it's really good. Um, and um, um, I, I sort of like took a, you know, felt tip marker and a piece of cardboard and I drew this. They took it in the basement and made like a hundred of them. And I came in on Monday morning and this poster was on every door, on every floor in my school. And my name's not even on it. And I was like, this, I, I sort of was just electrified by this. And I sort of thought, you know, I'm not sure like how, how much of a big deal uh, J.M.W. Turner is, uh, who painted the Bernie the House of the Lords and Commons, but there's only one of those hanging way downtown. <laughs> I've got a hundred of these suckers all over the school. More people are going to see this poster than would actually see the play. Then I, then, like, then I sort of got to go to the cast party with the drama kids who were all there, who had real charisma, by the way. And so like, all of a sudden I realized, oh, wait a second, you know, this is a point of entry into all these different worlds. And all you have to do is be enthusiastic, get interested in the play, figure out a way to do something that makes people go to the play and people will sort of like um, uh, figure out a way to bring you into their world. And so the idea that this art could go anywhere, you didn't have to go to a museum or a gallery, it could just be taped to a, um, you know, to the door of the gym in your school really sort of like seemed like, I sort of think this is what I want to do, but I couldn't figure out like, remember, remember or not remember, but you may have heard that there was no internet back then. So like, and I didn't know a single person who did this for a living or even that it was possible to do this for a living. This was all sort of like, you know, this weird thing that I sort of like was thinking was cool and interesting. And as nearly as I could figure out, my idea was that somehow, um, like real artists who did work that would be in the Cleveland Museum of Art would be approached by people like the kids in the drama club. And they would say, Mr. Turner, we're putting on a show. Could you stop painting that oil painting and just do a poster with the price and the time and everything on it? And if he needed the money, he would say, okay, sure, and do it, then go back to doing real art. And I didn't care about the real art at all. I just wanted to do the thing for the drama club. And um, I had no idea what this was. And then I, I love libraries, it, like a true nerdy introverted bookworm. My happy place was going to a library and just looking at books and looking up books. Um, and I found this book that changed my life at the age of 17. It's called Aim for a Job in Graphic Design Slash Art by Neil Fujita. And this, I opened it up and it was exactly what I wanted to do for a living. Fujita, who some of you may have heard of him, but if you haven't, he, des he designed the Columbia Records logo and most famously, a bunch of book covers, including the cover of The Godfather by Mario Puzo, which is basically the logo for the movie The Godfather. And so, you know, uh, he had real, um, you know, th th this was the voice of authority. He put together a book, maybe because he was, um, he was, uh, ja was Japanese-American and his parents had been, inter had been in uh, uh, internment camps during World War II. He really took pains to make the people he featured in the book really inclusive. So I remember there were black graphic designers, women graphic designers, Asian graphic designers. And it's just sort of seemed like, wow, this is like, like something that so many different people could do and make different contributions from their own points of view. So what's funny is that this book is part of a series, is part of the Aim High vocational series. See that at the top? 
And so other things, if, you, if graphic design wasn't your thing, perhaps a career as a barber or bank, or banking, then barber. It's sort of like, I can't make these two people right next to each other. Yeah, I think I might want to be a banker. Oh, oh, on the other hand, I do like cutting hair. So I'm like, I don't really know how much play the other books got, but I sort of, um, um, this book really did change my life because it put a name to the thing that I wanted to do. I told my guidance counselor, the thing I want to do is graphic design. She wrote it down really carefully, found out that in my very state of Ohio, I'll be at the other end of the state in Cincinnati, there was a, a program that was a, uh, master's of si uh, a bachelor's of science in graphic design at their school of design, architecture, and art. And so I enrolled there and